weird, exciting, and all together delightful. Um, Dr. Oshman is a pretty delightful author and speaker himself, the author of Energy Medicine with Scientific Basis. You can buy it on Amazon, or you can buy it on the FrequencySpecific.com website, and I will sign it for you. So let's get started. The first question most people ask is, where did the frequencies come from? Um, and to some extent, we'll never know the answer to that because frequencies were used from about 1908 through roughly 1935 by thousands of medical physicians and osteopaths until 1934. Um, um, how they were developed, how the research was done, who did the research, where it was published, how they shared it, that information is all lost because in 1910, the Flexner Report came out and decreed that drugs and surgery were the tools of medicine and that anybody that used electromagnetic therapies would lose their license to practice, which at that time was granted by the AMA. So uh, Flexner Report came out, 1917, they started um, promoting the fact that there were now accepted medical schools and there were accepted methods of treatment that included drugs and surgery and did not include herbs, homeopathy, nutrition, and electromagnetic therapies. And uh, by 1934, um, all of the devices went in the back room and got covered up with a seat and medical practice changed forever and right around that time. So all of the, the books on Grandpa's shelf and the journals and the devices themselves went on the trash heap when Grandpa died or Dad died. And um, so we honestly don't know how, are they, how they were developed, how they were used. Um, so that's lost. But the way we found out about the frequencies, I found out about the frequencies, was um, Harry Van Gelder was an osteopath and naturopath from um, Australia, who trained in England um, uh, during the war, after the war. He bought a practice in 1946. He came with a machine that was made in 1922, and that machine came with a list of frequencies. I was going to do that. Hang on one second. Let me get back. I just wanted to get that little distracting thing out of there. Um, uh, and a list of frequencies that was created in 1922. I got that list from George Douglas in 1995, and if you want more detail about how all of that transpired, I recommend the resonance effect for the full story. I started using them in 1995 to treat myofascial trigger points and myofascial pain, and started teaching it in 1997 as the frequency-specific microcurrent course. Uh, to find out if it was reproducible. And once we knew it was, was reproducible, um, we, uh, I had to keep teaching it because it would be immoral not to. 98, we found out how to treat nerve pain. 99, we found out how to treat the spinal cord. Um, and the frequencies appear to do exactly but only what they are alleged to do. Uncertain about how the frequencies were derived. Have no idea how they did that. Mechanism of action, we have some pretty good ideas about, and we finally have a testable model um, that <clears throat> tells us how the frequencies were, um, uh, that we can test to see exactly how the frequencies work, and we'll get to that in a little bit. I can tell you that the 1920s equipment was not microcurrent. Um, Albert Abrams was one of the medical physicians who had a clinic in San Francisco, and um, the electronic reactions of Dr. Abrams was one of the old-fashioned texts. So let's get to what frequency-specific microcurrent is good for. Um, there are some old problems in medicine, always a problem. How do you heal injuries more quickly? Whether they happen from trauma or wounds or surgery, um, there are some repair limitations for injuries. 
ATP production or energy production in the cells is limited by your general health and the health of the mitochondria and how much ATP or cellular energy your body can produce. How, how quickly and how well can your body build new blood vessels <coughs> to supply the repair tissue? How quickly and how effectively can your body create the collagen that it takes to repair connective tissue and the elastin that it takes to make that repair tissue mm, flexible, functional? So frequency-specific microcurrent um, has some good answers to these old problems. So.
cute. There you go. There we go. Woohoo. Are we there? Do we have it? Yeah. Okay. We're going to try this again. Uh, I'm not starting from the beginning, so I'm uh, assuming that y'all stayed with us here. So just the plain current by itself without the specific frequencies has been shown to increase ATP or cellular energy production by 500%. So microamperage current. This was tested in 1982 by Nok Cheng and Rapskin. 10 to 500 microamps increased ATP production by 500%. Um, increased protein synthesis by 70%. Increased amino acid transport by 40%. And then Seegers in 2001 and 2002 reproduced these findings and demonstrated that just the current, just DC current at 10 to 500 micrograms increased cyclic AMP in human lymphocytes in vivo. So we know it works both in rat skin and in cell cultures and in human tissue. Um, Seegers hypothesized or demonstrated, I should say, that the current by itself activates signal transduction. So how do you deliver microcurrent? Um, microcurrent devices, these are pictures of the devices that we use here at Frequency Specific, but um, all microcurrent devices are approved in the category of TENS devices, um, even though they're not TENS devices. TENS devices use milliamps. Microcurrent devices use millions of an amp. Um, they're approved um, for aesthetic use, which is not a prescription, um, and it's the same device. So not a prescription, okay for estheticians to use, same device approved for pain management, um, and it is prescription. So it's billed as a TENS. Microcurrent devices across um, spectrum vary widely. You have direct current, a pulse direct current, you have various waveforms, sine waves, scale, square waves, ramp square waves. Some have one channel, some have two channels. Some are combined with ultrasound and interferential and galvanic and microcurrent. And in general, for most of the devices, frequency is not important. Now, they have a limited number of frequencies or they do a sweep of frequencies. Um, now, since FSM has come along, um, there is more of a market for microcurrent, so you find a number of microcurrent devices um, out available on the market. So, what does the current by itself do? Well, 20 days of microcurrent applied to rabbits. So if you biopsy a bunny and then you put it full feet on wet contacts, an hour a day, five, four days, five, day, five days a week, four weeks in a row, 20 days of microcurrent for an hour a day, um, it increased the blood supply in the rabbit skin, and they used rabbits because they are closest to human um, epidermis and dermis. So it increased the blood supply to the skin by 39%. It increased collagen by 14%. So that would ensure an adequate blood supply to wounds that are healing or trauma that's healing, increased collagen to repair the connective tissue in the wound. But here's the most important part. Just the current increase elastin by 50 percent, 48 percent, and that means that the repair tissue you lay down is going to be um, flexible and healthy, well vascularized, and very normal just by applying current to it. So you have to ask what would happen to that old problem of injury and wound healing outcomes if you could increase ATP blood supply or vascularity 
collagen and elastin. So in addition to that, though, the frequency effect makes a huge difference in healing. Unmodulated microcurrent increases ATP production. But we have a study that actually shows that the addition of frequencies to microcurrent um, treatment helps in the repair of new injuries. So this was a controlled trial. It compared frequency-specific microcurrent um, on one leg to a placebo um, machine that was off on the other leg. And the study was um, the same design as a 1999 trial that showed that a single channel microcurrent at 3 tenths of a hertz and 30 hertz for 20 minutes was not affected at all in delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, by comparison, this control trial with an active frequency specific treated leg and a placebo leg, this was done by Denise Curtis in 2010, the frequencies that were used were those to stop bleeding, repair tissue that's torn or broken, and reduce inflammation and increase vitality. And um, the results were quite profound. So um, the sham leg at 24 hours, if you've done any exercise that's going to make you sore the next day, you know that you're at your worst two days after the exercise, right? So the sham leg at 24 hours was 5.2 out of 10. The treated leg was 1.3. The sham leg was a 7 out of 10. The treated leg was 1.2. And at 72 hours, the sham leg was a 4, and the treated leg was a 0.7. With um, just 20 patients in the study, the p-value or the statistical significance has three zeros and a five at all time measures. And for those of you that are familiar with medical statistics, that is a huge, huge statistical significance and um, could not be achieved by chance or placebo effect at all. The other thing that's important about delayed onset muscle soreness is that there is no other effective treatment or uh, prevention. So a frequency-specific microcurrent and delayed onset muscle soreness, for those of you athletes out there, is pretty much the only game in town, um, which makes us very happy. It also makes the NFL happy and the NHL happy, less so the NBA that just never figured it out, and there are a couple of baseball teams using it and um, American hockey and Canadian hockey is beginning to use uh, frequency-specific. Post-operative outcomes, post-operative uh, wounds certainly count as wounds. So this study was done by John Cale about four years ago. Um, short in a hospital stay, um, p-value is 0 0.05, the FSM group, so he did C-sections, he's an OBGYN, did C-sections on a group of patients and then compared them to patients in the hospital data bank that had a similar or same surgery by, their, by either himself or another OBGYN surgeon. So the FSM group got out in 2.9 days. The control group got out in about three and a third days. So the hospital stays are shorter. And the patient's pain is significantly less. So pain at rest, um, these differences have um, 0 0.003, which is huge. Um, pain at rest was 1.8 out of 10 for the untreated group and a 0.5, so less than a 1 in the treated group. And pain was a 5 out of 10, uh, which is pretty high in the untreated group, and about a 3 out of 10 in the FSM group. And um, if you've ever had a C-section or any sort of surgery, you know the difference between a five and a three is pretty significant. So if you're healing wounds, um, those of you that have diabetes or know a diabetic or have ever seen or worked with somebody with diabetic wounds, you'll recognize these feet. This patient had a seven centimeter long wound on the medial aspect of his uh, left leg, you can see his toes. We'll discuss that later. You're familiar with the bronzing and the purple and the edema. Look at the swelling in his lower legs. Um, this ulcer was healed completely in six treatments over three weeks. So the patient was treated twice a week for three weeks, and that wound just simply went away. Um, he had the second digit 
was um, actually set to be amputated, and um, he sought treatment with the Nori Collar in Texas. And at the end of 12 treatments, it was resolved. This shows it at um, six treatments, I think. And then this third digit resolved in seven, seven treatments. So this is, a, this is a man that would have lost probably two toes at least, if not more. And all of the toes were spared, and his, he still has his feet. Um, peripheral neuropathy is pain and numbness in the feet. And um, um, he had uh, eight out of ten areas in the sole of his foot <coughs> numb on July 2nd. And by August 2nd, eight treatments in four weeks, he had completely normal sensation and no pain in his feet. So there is no no treatment that will do this for a diabetic patient, both in healing the nerves, healing the blood vessels, and healing the wounds. And frequency-specific microcurrent makes such a huge difference in these kinds of cases. So another real problem in medicine is inflammation. All of the degenerative diseases and immune system activation um, create um, um, all of the degenerative diseases that plague um, our population. And we have, thank goodness, anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, there is a problem with anti-inflammatory drugs, so they take too long. Takes, uh, you feel better in about 24 hours, and takes about three to five days for things to really change. Um, but they're um, Celebrates, for example, is associated with an increase in heart attacks because it blocks the prostaglandins that help you rebuild the inside of your arteries. Um, the uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs have negative effects not only in the blood vessels in the heart, blood vessels in the kidney, and so they cause kidney damage. They also block the prostaglandins that that rebuild your digestive system. So it's associated with digestive upset and ulcers. And um, it's also associated with ringing in the ears because of the damage that it causes to the inner air. So, and then medically, um, the cytokines, the inflammatory peptides that mediate a lot of the long-term degenerative diseases Cytokines are hard to change, and when they change, they change slowly over one to two month period. And those are the biological drugs that we're familiar with in autoimmune diseases. So all of the inflammation that causes health problems, degenerative diseases and immune system activation, what would happen to this problem if you could reduce lipoxygenase-mediated inflammation by 62% in four minutes? and reduce COX-mediated inflammation, uh, as in Celebrex, um, by 30% in four minutes. Well, we found that out with FSN in an animal trial that was done at University of Australia in, in Sydney, um, the University of Sydney Veterinary Science Department in Australia. Um, we had um, Vivian Lee was a researcher there and they did a study where they paint arachidonic acid on the mouse's ears. Vivian had studied anti-inflammatory drugs for 20 years, and she did this trial in 2001 or two, I think. Um, it's been a long time now. Um, so they paint arachidonic acid on the mouse's ears, and then they measure the swelling. So it's a fairly simple, low-tech, um, easy to do experiment, as long as you have the mice and the calipers. So you measure the ears, and that's how much the ears swell when you put arachidonic acid on them. Um, it causes a lipoxygenase mediated inflammation in the ear that creates swelling. Well, they ran 40 hertz on channel A and 116 hertz on channel B for the immune system. 40 and 116, inflammation, reduce inflammation in the immune system. And the 
lipoxygenase-mediated inflammation went down by 62% in four minutes in every animal tested. Um, actually, it went down by 70%, and that disturbed Vivian enough that she uh, shut down the experiment, sent everybody home for the day, had them come back the next day, and she put everybody into separate rooms because in 20 years of doing anti-inflammatory drug research, she had never tested any drug prescription or over-the-counter that reduced inflammation by more than 45%. So 62% reduction in four minutes uh, was unheard of. So she repeat, well, 70% was unheard of. So she repeated it with everybody blinded and, um, and she inserted a placebo frequency and turned the machine away from Wayne Riley, who was treating the mouse. Um, and it was still a 62% reduction in lipoxygenase mediated inflammation. Then they did meristeal stearate, which causes a COX mediated inflammation. That's the sort of thing that's turned around by Celebrex. <clears throat> and you got a 30% reduction in COX mediated inflammation, which doesn't sound as good, but it's equivalent to injectable toradol, which is what they give patients in the hospital after, let's say, hip or knee replacement surgery. It is quite a strong non steroidal anti inflammatory. All of the animals responded, and it was a four minute time dependent response. So half the effect was there at two minutes, the full effect was there at four minutes. Additionally, she checked to make sure that uh, it wasn't just the current. So she tested other frequencies besides 40 and 116, just one tenth of a hertz, just enough to reduce inflammation. Um, and that produced no reduction in swelling. Four minutes of the frequency are frequencies for reducing mineral deposits in bone. There's no bone in mouse, mouse is here. Um, that gave no reduction in ear swelling. And then four minutes of the specific frequencies that we think of as being for intermediate injuries, so trauma, paralysis, allergy reaction, um, no reduction in swelling. And then four minutes of inflammation in the skin likewise gave no reduction in swelling. So it was a very frequency-specific response, rather extraordinary, actually. And then they sunburned the mice. Um, and yeah, I feel sorry for the mice too, so I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, so they, you, if you sunburn a mouse um, and don't treat them at 21, 23, 25, and 27 hours, this is what the swelling looks like. Okay. If you treat them immediately with microcone after the sunburn, the swelling is obviously less, but it's not statistically significant for a group of 20 mice. Um, then if you sunburn the mice and you wait two hours, so this is immediate treatment, this is two hours uh, treatment, um, if you wait two hours and then treat them, you get a statistically significant reduction in swelling, which I'm sure was nice for the mice, uh, to at 21, 23, 25, and 27 hours. And at the last three time points, it reached 0.01 statistical significance, which is uh, quite respectable. So the other thing that happens is that sunburn suppresses immune system response. The mechanism for that is too complicated to go into, but um, it's just part of the standard immune system test for anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, they, uh, at the time of the sunburn, they paint a contact sensitizing agent on the hind leg at the time of the sunburn. And then two weeks later, that same agent an agent that you should develop an allergic response to and should cause swelling and inflammation, that same agent is painted on the ear. So the group that was sunburned and um, uh, not treated, so the not, sorry, the group that had oxazolone painted on their hind leg at time zero, and then two weeks later, they had oxazolone painted on their ear, had 30 units of swelling. This is a normal response. The group that was sunburned, 
had a Fazlon painted on their hind leg and then two weeks later painted on their ear and this And that's really good, right? But here's the odd part. The group that was treated immediately with microcurrent had their immune suppression reduced by half. So if you treated them immediately, they didn't have a great reduction in swelling. But, the, but two weeks later, the immune suppression was reduced from 63% to 31%. It was reduced by half two weeks after a single four-minute application of a frequency, and one and only one frequency combination. Of all the data that we have, actually, this one slide, well, it's probably the most complicated to understand from an immunology, immunology standpoint, is the most significant piece of data we have. If you think about it, a single four-minute treatment changed immune system response permanently um, as measured at two weeks. It's, um, it's quite impressive. So what, how is that relevant to, well, lipoxygenation, cyclooxygenation, mediated inflammation, try saying that three times fast. Lipoxygenation, cyclooxygenation, mediated inflammation, is associated with all degenerative conditions. So that includes asthma, COPD, irritable bowel um, syndrome, and inflammatory bowel diseases such as Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, pancreatitis, we've had very good case reports with liver disease, we have good uh, case reports showing reductions in liver, elevated liver enzymes, rheumatoid arthritis and degenerative arthritis, Lox and Cox mediated inflammation are associated with all degenerative conditions, um, in, including actually um, uh, Alzheimer's and cognitive decline. So the cytokines, the inflammatory peptides that are elevated in um, neurologic inflammation and autoimmune diseases, what would happen if you could reduce all of the inflammatory cytokines in 90 minutes? And what would happen if they all stopped in the normal range? The problem with the biological drugs that they use to reduce cytokines is that those drugs drop the cytokines below the normal range, and um, you need a certain normal level of cytokines to keep from getting cancer and infection. So there are some problems with the medications that reduce cytokines. So we have this uh, one paper uh, cytokine changes with microcurrent treatment of fibromyalgia associated with spine trauma. Not exactly a snappy title, but it's a pretty snappy paper. 54 consecutive fibromyalgia patients with a history of trauma. This means I didn't leave anybody out. So everybody that came in in a one-year period, year-and-a-half period, um, with fibromyalgia associated with spine trauma or a history of trauma uh, was included in the study. Um, the average chronicity was about nine and a half years. And then when I presented um, a case report of 25 cases at NIH in 2000, um, I asked the assembled um, scientists if anybody could help me gather data on this group of patients because they come in at an average of a seven, they leave at an average of a, a 1 in terms of pain, so 7 out of 10, they leave at a 1 out of 10. And I knew, everybody knew, no one was going to believe me uh, unless we had data. So uh, the patients didn't differ in age or chronicity. Uh, so this blood sample data was representative of the whole set. Um, so 
cervical trauma, fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia associated with spine trauma accounts for 28% of fibromyalgia patients or in the U.S. alone, 2 million patients. There is only one frequency combination expected that was clinical. It's 40 hertz on channel A, 10 hertz on channel B. If you read the paper, it says it was chosen by trial and error. It actually wasn't. 40 hertz is the frequency to reduce inflammation. 10 hertz is the frequency to address the spinal cord. The treatment is applied from the patient's neck to the patient's feet, and their pain goes from a 7.4 to 1.3 in 90 minutes. The recovery from fibromyalgia is individualized. They all had frequency-specific microcurrent in the office. Some of them had needed or had a home unit to keep their pain down below a four. Once you get the pain down below a four, um, the, um, the neuroendocrine chaos that is fibromyalgia resolves kind of on its own if you can keep the pain down at a three or four. Most of the patients had physical therapy. Most of them needed reconditioning. Most of them took supplements. We still had to treat the irritable bowel, the adrenals. Some patients had interstitial cystitis. We were able to treat that as well. So when I got the data back from NIH, interleukin-1 went, we tested this first patient. Interleukin-1 went from an average of 392 down to 21. Well, I called a colleague <coughs> who... Um, um, his name was Michael Ruff. He works in Candace, worked with Candace Pert in their office at CW in Washington, D.C. And um, he was one of the primary researchers in uh, cytokine um, research in the U.S. And I told him I had some cytokine data I didn't entirely understand, and could he help me realize the significance of it? Because back in 2000, I couldn't look it up in Google, and I had to make this this slide, this graph, the night before a lecture at the Functional Medicine Symposium. So Dr. Ruff very kindly said, yeah, yeah, what are the numbers? And I said, well, interleukin-1 goes from 392 down to 21, and the phone got very quiet, and he said, what time frame? I said, oops. And it was kind of like the phone hung up. And he said, are, I said, are you, are you there? He said, yeah, cytokines are hard to change. And when they change, they change slowly over weeks or months. You know, change in 90 minutes. I said, well, yeah, they do. They're all like that. So what are you talking about? I said, well, chnf alpha went down from 300 down to 20 in 90 minutes. Uh, interleukin-6 went down from 200 down to 15. CGRP went down, 168 chnf alpha. Interferon gamma went down. I don't have slides on it for this, but... All of the inflammatory cytokines drop by factors of 10 and 20 times in 90 minutes, and it is unheard of. Um, so he said, well, I don't know what you're doing, but let me know when you publish the paper. So it took us four years to get the paper published, in part because um, nobody wanted to publish a paper that said fibromyalgia was curable. So we changed the title to the cytokine changes and um, um, JBMT published it, um, which was quite an honor. Anyway, so I uh, show, was showing the data at the Functional Medicine Symposium, and David Perlmutter, Dr. Perlmutter, who wrote Grain Brain, um, was there. He was one of the speakers as well. And uh, he said, well, what happens to substance P? Substance P is produced in the spinal cord, and if substance P changes, then you know you are indeed changing the spinal cord. And I said, well, funny you should mention, substance P goes down from 132 down to 10. And he said, uh, everybody that sees this data is sort of non-plus because they're, these are huge changes. And the P values have two and three zeros just with six patients. These are unheard of statistical significance because the changes are so big. Endorphins go up by a factor of more than 10 times. And at about the 30, 20 minute mark, the patients are pretty much so stoned they can't talk. The blink rate slows down, they relax, their heart rate goes down, their um, eyes close, and they would really rather not be bothered to, to open their eyes. Um, 
you may be familiar with Jeff Bland, who's um, the founder of the Institute for Functional Medicine. His description of it is an induced euphoria. So at the end of 60 minutes, the um, endorphins have gone from uh, 5 to um, uh, 80. And uh, so they've increased by more than a factor of 10 times. It's just quite a pleasant, floaty, dude effect. Um, cortisol goes up, uh, but it's not a stress response because um, neuropeptide Y goes down, um, which is that, that data isn't shown. But if you want to know why cortisol goes up, if you're going to raise endorphins by a factor of more than 10 times, you are going to raise HDTH or um, um, corticotrophin releasing hormone, um, uh, the precursor to cortisol um, by an equal amount. And so the cortisol goes up. Pain level for these patients went from a 7.3 to a 1.3 in um, 90 minutes with a chronicity of uh, an average of seven years. And this p-value actually has six zeros, but the statistician was British, and he said that anything more than three zeros was shown off. All patients experienced pain relief. 58% recovered from fibromyalgia within four months, and that, that timeline was, is very um, consistent. Um, 13 out of 53 discontinued treatment for reasons not related to treatment side effects. And um, most of them, I think, if you looked at it, um, if your pain has been an average of a seven for 14 or 15 years, at the end of 90 minutes when you're pain free, you simply don't know who you are. And back in 2000, 2001, and 2002, when we collected this data, I wasn't very good at helping people through that transition. I think it's, it's better now. Um, so this patient had 14 of 18 tender points in December. In December, um, January, she had 11 of 18 tender points. And February, she had recovered from fibromyalgia and had 7 of 18 tender points, tender than less than 4 pounds per square inch pressure. Range of motion improved. Pain medication was down. Um, muscle relaxants were down. She was sleeping well with no medication and um, her digestion improved and the IBS resolved. Six year follow up, she still was recovered. So the most important thing you or your family or your loved ones need to know or your patients need to know is uh, about fibromyalgia is that it's curable. Uh, the, the modern approach for the old problems in medicine is functional medicine, looking at the causes of illness and um, intervening in systems biology fashion, um, a physiologic um, fashion to look at what's causing the illness and addressing that with diet and lifestyle changes, supplements, and uh, sometimes medication. And functional medicine, I've been a, a practice, functional medicine practitioner for 22 uh, years now, and it works great but it takes too long. Um, their data uh, usually shows uh, 12 to 14 months to produce huge improvements in function. It takes too long and it costs too much. The visits and the follow-ups for coaching and diet and supplements um, are quite expensive or can be expensive, probably still less expensive than surgery or most of the drugs that are available now, but that's another conversation. If you could um, shorten the time and reduce the cost to create a functional medicine solution for a medical problem, that would be ideal. And that's what FSM does. FSM works immediately to reduce pain and increase ATP energy, so you don't have to do it quite so much with supplements and diet. But FSM needs a functional medicine approach to create lasting and stable improvements. So if I treat your irritable bowel or Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis and um, I can get you into remission in one or two sessions, 
But unless you go on a gluten-free diet, and sometimes a corn and dairy-free diet, I'm afraid to say, um, the FSM um, treatments are not going to be as effective. So FSM and functional medicine are an ideal combination for most of the modern, um, um, for most of the old problems in medicine in degenerative diseases. So old problems in medicine, nerve pain, muscle pain, and scar tissue. Um, nerve pain, muscle pain, and scar tissue. So treating um, the nerve pain is not very effective medically. The drugs have significant side effects and are quite expensive. Treatment for muscle pain and scar tissue revision takes too long and it honestly costs too much. So FSM has outstanding outcomes. Nerve pain, I can stay with a completely straight face. Nerve pain is the easiest thing we treat. Um, I've only got one paper published in this area. There's another one in the pipeline on um, chronic pain with ul ulnar nerve transposition. We're just waiting to uh, to submit it to a journal. Um, but this paper was published in 2010. 20 patients, the average chronicity was seven years with neuropathic pain. All patients experienced pain reduction. First treatment, their pain went from an average of a seven to an average of a two. The second treatment that they came in with their pain at a 4.8, so when it, it went up from 1.8 to a 4.8, but when they left after the second treatment, um, it was less than a one. Um, and you notice that it never gets as bad as it was when they came in the first time. So treating neuropathic pain is very effective. 65% of these very chronic patients, seven years, with their pain level, you know, between a five and a seven is pretty tough. 65% um, fully recovered in around five sessions. These are nerve tracts and injuries and disc bolt is causing sciatica and radiculopathies. There are no adverse reactions with neuropathic pain. However, 25% terminated care prior to recovery. Um, and this, this is in spite of the fact that all patients experience pain reduction. So um, it suggests that once again, if your pain level has been a seven for seven years, the end of an hour when your pain is a zero, you kind of don't know who you are. And it takes some time to adjust to that. I think we're better now at helping people through that transition, but um, uh, the patients who terminated care, terminated care for reasons not related to treatment side effects, which it's, uh, these are quite spectacular outcomes in nerve pain. Myofascial pain and trigger points, um, there were 50 cases that published in 1998, an average of five years chronic. Um, range was one to 28 years. 88% had failed with other treatments. So the patients rather served as their own controls. They were gonna have a placebo effect, it's presumed that they would have had it with one of the other six people that had treated them um, in five years before they got to FSM and, and our clinic. Took 11 visits in eight weeks to get them from an average of a 6.8 down to 1.5. And um, that's honestly because I didn't know what I was doing. I kept treating the muscles. And what we found since then is if you treat the discs and the facets and the ligaments um, and even the spinal cord and the nerves, uh, the myofascial pain is very, very easy to fix. And the lumbar spine patients are more representative of what we do in simple myofascial pain eight years chronicity, range was about two months to 20 years. Once again, the patient served as their own controls because 87% had failed with other treatments. And this is more representative of what we find with chronic myofascial trigger points and myofascial pain. Six visits in six weeks uh, to bring them from an average starting pain level of a 6.8 and get them down to a 1.6. You can have a life at a two or a three pain level. Um, it's kind of tough when it gets up to around the seven. So um, we did a burn center project where we um, treated, used the frequencies for scarring to treat um, patients uh, with chronic burns. Uh, I treated eight patients in uh, an hour apiece for three days, Dr. Bart Flick organized this trial. Roger Huckfeld was the 
chair of the burn unit, our head of the burn unit, and um, his staff collaborated with us in, um, in treating these patients. And every patient has statistically significant permanent increases in range of motion after three one-hour treatments, which sounds sort of dry, but when you realize that what it meant for one man was that he got out of the wheelchair for the first time in three years because he could bend his ankles and his knees and they could get him in braces and get him up and get him to walking. Um, we had an abdominal research adhesion trial at Baylor um, Medical School with David Weisman. He has a procedure where he induced um, abdominal adhesions in a rat one week and um, then you open the rat up the next week and we applied microcurrent on either side of the rat's abdomen while the rat was anesthetized obviously and open and um, there are probably five or six frequencies that I, was, that I tried and the fourth one 13 hertz on channel A and 77 hertz on channel B simply and completely liquefied this adhesion that was in front of us. And the adhesion looks cartilaginous and white and hard and um, if you went to cut it, you'd have to cut it with scissors because it's pretty hard to get a scalpel through it. It's that kind of tough abdominal adhesion. And um, 13 and 77 simply made it turn to, well, it's not, actually. It just liquefied and got stringy and, um, yeah, just turned to liquid. Fascinating. Then we treated eight patients with abdominal infusion the next day, and um, uh, they all came, were very chronic, abdominal pain and, and pelvic adhesion patients, abdominal adhesion patients and pelvic pain, abdominal pain, and um, all seven of them left pain-free uh, with no tenderness. And I think out of the seven with only one treatment, uh, I think five out of the seven had last, uh, results that lasted at least um, four weeks, so we did a one-month follow-up. Um, this has a lot of promise for chronic uh, abdominal pain patients. Uh, FSM and manual therapy, when you're treating adhesions or scarring, um, uh, it works best when combined with manual therapy. This is Kim Pittis, who obviously loves her work, um, and she is working on an Olympic swimmer who has had adhesions uh, and muscle tightness in his low back. So you pin the muscle and then move the trunk while you're running the frequencies to dissolve the adhesions, and that's Kim Pittis. If you check our website, you'll find her FSM Sports Seminar, um, and I highly recommend it. It's quite amazing. So as you have guessed, frequency-specific microcurrent is the new tool. It's going to be the solution for all of these problems. Uh, the frequencies were developed in the early 1900s. I got this list in 1995 and have been doing clinical work with it and teaching it and doing research with it since 1995. And it, they have been quite extraordinary. The frequency effect matches the description that was on this list. So <clears throat> on the list, 40 hertz had as the description inflammation. So it reduces inflammation. So it's thought of as neutralizing the um, uh, pathology uh, that's described. So reducing inflammation, uh, it reduces pain, it reduces redness, swelling, uh, does, and that's all it does. It reduces inflammation. That's the one we used in the mice, and that's the one we used in the fibromyalgia patients. It reduces pain, but it doesn't change range of motion. The frequencies for fibrosis and scar tissue solve scarring increases range of motion, but doesn't do anything to reduce the pain. So when you treat a fibromyalgia patient, you're in 40 hertz on channel A and the spinal cord on channel B, and that takes the pain down. But if you want to increase the patient's range of motion, you have to run the frequencies for scarring in the spinal cord and scarring in the dura. That increases the range of motion, but does absolutely nothing for the pain. Frequency to stop hemorrhage stops bleeding and pain in the menses. It prevents bruising and new injuries and takes the pain down in post-operative treatments. 
frequencies for mineral iron deposits, soften tissue, reduce pain, little bit of range of motion, nothing at all for inflammation, nothing at all for bleeding, and nothing at all for scarring. It simply softens tissue. Um, there's one frequency, the only thing it's good for, it's a frequency combination actually, is shingles in oral and genital herpes. It reduces the pain, eliminates the lesions in 48 hours or so, 72 hours, reduces the pain in a single two or four hour treatment, and that reduction is permanent if the patient has acute shingles. This frequency combination is not useful in post-herpetic neuralgia. So um, if you know anybody that has shingles or has gotten shingles in the last two weeks, get them to a frequency-specific microcurrent practitioner. There is one frequency combination that is useful for kidney stone pain. So far, it is effective in every case, but it's not good for anything else. All it does is take down the kidney stone pain. It doesn't do anything for the stone itself. That you have to run mineral ion deposits in the kidney. It's an absolutely fascinating frequency-specific resonance effect. Um, this was um, treatment of shingles case report published in 2010. We are going to run over time because we started a little bit late and then our platform crashed. So I'll keep talking. And um, if you have to uh, leave the group, you'll find the webinar on YouTube. And um, I'll look us up and finish this fascinating case. So this is singles in the ophthalmic branch of five in an 85-year-old man. There is one frequency combination that is effective. Four hours of treatment. He was pain-free in one hour. There was no return of pain, and the lesions were gone in 48 hours. So that is published as a single case report in practical pain management, um, in part because 85-year-old men do not recover from singles in the ophthalmic branch of five. They almost universally end up with post-herpetic neuralgia, and um, that is what they die of or what they die with. It's pretty horrific. And uh, this particular 85-year-old man was Dr. David Simons, who wrote um, the Trigger Point Manual. So how can specific frequencies change conditions in specific tissues? Well, the short version is that the human body is a quantum biological system. Um, as a large body, you follow Newtonian physics. You know, if you get dropped off a building, you accelerate it. Uh, 32 feet per second per second. Um, but on the molecular level, Newtonian physics falls apart. Um, and your body is molecular. All living tissue is made up of biochemicals. Okay, what are biochemicals made of? Well, molecules. What are those molecules made of? Atoms. What are the atoms made of? Subatomic particles. Well, that's quantum. All of these molecules, atoms, and subatomic particles are held together by electromagnetic bonds. And here's the kicker. Every bond, either mechanical or electromagnetic, has a frequency at which it resonates, resonates or has a resonant frequency. So your body is an electromagnetic system that looks solid, but the cells function as a semiconductor network. Those of you that are interested in this phenomenon, I highly recommend Pollock's book, um, Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, the water in your body is organized around this gel matrix that's inside the cells and through the cells, and it makes the water inside of the cell basically a gel. And because of the way the hydrogen atoms flicker, they have a hole or a space that in their outer shell that makes you effectively, makes your whole body into a big semiconductor, kind of like a computer chip. And that semiconductor conveys current charge and vibrational information. So the fact of how your body works is that every cell has hundreds if not thousands of um, membrane receptors on the outside, in the outside membrane. And these receptors are made out of proteins. 
they, these receptors determine cellular function by way of kinases and transcription factors that alter genetic expression and create the, the cell's biological answer to whatever was the signal up here. So if you have a stimulus like a, a bacterial fragment that lands on this receptor, the cell's response is to create inflammation. So the receptors reconfigure in response to cellular, in response to stimuli, and the receptor changes, alters cell signaling and cell function, and I suspect eventually cell structure. So biologic resonance explains the effects of frequencies on living tissue. Drugs or nutrients may act like keys in a lock to change these receptors um, mechanically, more or less, um, and therefore change intracellular function and response. The frequencies act like your key fob, opening the lock with an electromagnetic signal, and it is our hypothesis that this electromagnetic signal um, changes membrane protein configuration electromagnetically. Um, just like your key fob opens your door lock with a signal instead of a key, the frequencies act as if they dissolve scar tissue cross links that hold the scars in a shortened configuration by vibrating with them. So they simply come apart like um, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge or like a uh, singer when they uh, break a, a lead crystal glass by hitting exactly the right note. It simply dissolves the crosslinks by making them come apart or shatter. It acts as if it disassembles the, the capsule on the virus. There's nothing else that explains how quickly it works in the shingles virus. And it acts as if it changes cell signaling and reduces inflammation by changing this membrane receptor configuration. You can learn how to use frequency-specific microcurrent um, by purchasing the textbook, Frequency-Specific Microcurrent and Pain Management. Uh, it's pretty dry, but it um, uh, teaches you all of the um, pain management protocols that are frequency-specific. Um, you can take a, a three-day seminar. Uh, whoops, four-day. Sorry, didn't get that slide changed. It's a four-day seminar. Now, because just the course seminar has just changed so much in the last um, 20 years that it, there's just too much information. It's cruel to try and do it in three days. So um, FSM is a new tool that allows you to solve these old problems in medicine, <clears throat> medicine by using resonance, the resonance effect, as um, and and the current to solve these old problems in, in medicine. I suggest you go to the website, www.frequencyspecific.com. Um, uh, the resonance effect is um, probably the best view on how FSM was developed and how it works. And it is quite an easy read and a pretty quick read. Um, so this four-day life-changing seminar, we have uh, Jacksonville, Chicago, left in the U.S., um, Nuremberg, uh, December 1st through the 4th, Jacksonville in September, October is Chicago, Cleveland Clinic, January 18th to the 21st, and that Cleveland seminar is going to be co-taught by our colleagues at Cleveland Clinic Functional Medicine Institute and the Pediatric PM&R uh, group, so those of you that are medical physicians, um, the Cleveland seminar looks like it's going to be approved for Category 1 Continuing Medicaid Medical Education uh, Credit, sponsored by Cleveland Clinic. Uh, course seminar will be Phoenix, uh, sponsored by uh, Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine, February 22nd to 25th, and Portland, April 5th through the 8th. Um, go to FrequencySpecific.com for the seminar schedule. I have to warn you, though. Frequency-specific microcurrent will change your life, your practice, your life if you're a patient or a doctor, actually, your practice and your outcomes forever. Once you see what the frequencies do and once you experience it, 
really don't ever get to go back. I wish you well, enjoy the summer, and we'll see you next month. Yay. I would really like to get through this one time. Stop sharing without technical difficulties. Still says I'm connected to audio though. I should mute. Yeah, it's still. How am I? Still so? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.